Hey, Collider fans, this is John Broca. If you like our shows, you are going to love Zane's World on Podcast One. World traveler, author, and alcohol aficionado, Zane Lambrey is well-learned in the art of having a good time as he reviews the best attractions and destinations on the globe and shares the craziest stories behind his travels. Check out Zane's World every Tuesday on Podcast One or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. <laughs> What's up, Movie Trivia Schmodown fans? Welcome to the Schmodown Rundown, the official after show for the Movie Trivia Schmodown. I am your host. Should I say with the most? I don't really like that. I am your host from Houston, Texas, Brad Gilmore, and I am joined uh, from Chicago, Illinois, the man that makes Illinois, Frank Janish. Wow, you're really off your game. You take one week off and you're just completely off, off your game. Well, you know... <laughs> I'm I'm about as on my game as Carmelo Anthony is. So we'll just say that. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. You can know you could be uh, uh the host with the toast. I like toast, so you know. Host with the toast. Uh-huh. Okay. Host I could do toast. that. I, I don't do know. That. Hey, I think you know what I think you know what I think we should do? Um to bury the hatchet between between you and I and to end our, our beef forevermore. I, I should talk to my man Daryl Morey. I should talk to my man Daryl Morey. I should talk to my man T Man for Tita. And and I should see if we can arrange something to where we can. Daryl Morey is the general manager for the Houston Rockets. Tillman Fertitta, the owner of the Houston Rockets. I'm gonna see okay. if we can just if we can get Carmelo to go to the Bulls. I mean, at least y'all will be somewhat relevant. <sighs> and then we look can kind of just make this. Look, at, he had his opportunity easy. a few years ago. He declined. Uh, he's washed up, and you can you can go elsewhere. I don't care. Well, I'm just I just wanted to extend the courtesy. I can That's very nice of you. Cuz because I want to end this Katie Draymond thing we have going on here. You know, and I just <laughs> want to put it into it uh you know, put a little finality, put a bow on it. So, anyway, well, I guess that if you're not going to accept my offer, screw you, Frank Janish. Hey, we got a lot to talk about. It's great to be uh back on the show after taking a week off last week. Um much to talk about. We have uh, special guests joining us. We have the winners of the Anarchy Tournament. Spoiler I've alert. I've called it from day one. Spoiler alert. Who's the boss? Who's the boss would be joining <laughs> from us day on one, the yeah. show? <laughs> I've called it from day one, brother. I'm just yeah. telling you the truth. <laughs> I called it from day one. They won. They proved me correct, as always. And uh, we're, we're going to have them on. We're going to talk about what an epic match. And can I just say one thing? Because we're going to get into it with them, of course. We'll get into the breakdown, breakdown, breakdown. But a couple of weeks ago on this show, I made, I would say a proclamation would be the appropriate uh, term for it. I made a proclamation that one professor, long, but by the way, I look like a professor of my jacket. You a little bit. One professor. Yeah, I did. School of the Hold Elite on. right there, yeah. <laughs> one professor named Lon Harris. Would develop a serious condition that we in the psychological field call the yips. And you know what? He proved me right, just like Ben and Mark did, proving me right with the winner. Uh, Mr. Lon proved me right with the yips. Professor, class is out of session. I'm afraid you didn't get it enough credits to pass this course this semester. Better luck in the spring, brother. Oh my goodness! I mean, like, yeah. If you, if you say something enough, uh, eventually it, it can be right. Yeah, yeah. That's, it happens. Yeah. It happens. Hey, a broken clock is right. I think a couple times a day or something like that. Yeah, I don't forget the like phrase. It. Yeah, something like that. Um. Anyway, so it's going to be back. We got to talk a couple of news items before we get those guys on. Once again, Ben Bateman, Mark Riley. Congratulations to them. I'm excited to have them on. Um. But let's talk about some news. We know a live event is coming up. We don't know where the live event is. I, I haven't been told. I haven't been privy to any insider information like a lot of people might think that I am. I know nothing. But I do know a date. I know a date. And the date is January 
the 26th, we know that the next live Schmodown event will happen. Is that right, Frank Janish? That's uh, what I saw on Twitter. A Christian posted it. And I'm very excited that it's, in fact, going to be the season debut for next year. And uh, it's going to be live. And I think what what was... I don't know if... Have the matches been announced? What, what uh, been t- I don't know. I, I can't recall. Um, but nonetheless, it's going to be 26 somewhere. And uh, it could maybe it's in Chicago because you know there's that poll up, and uh, is there you know, a poll? There was a poll uh, a little a couple poll. couple weeks ago, and Chicago, uh-huh. you know, Christian made notice uh, that Chicago was was pretty up high on the list, so it's a possibility. I don't know. I hope that'd be pretty sweet. It would save me a trip. <laughs> you know, uh, as Drizzy Drake said, "H Town, my second home, like I'm James Harden," and I think that uh, the Schmodown will be coming. To H Town. Did if an I had angel to just guess. get his wings? Is that what I just heard? An angel just get their wings? Uh, yeah. I actually, I think, I, th- I think Lon Harris just got a couple extra questions right. Oh, but- um, I think that must have been what it was. <laughs> it's a little late on that, though. It's a little late, Lon. Sorry, brother. Sorry, brother. He's trying to get back in the game, trying to saddle back up again. Uh, but we know it's going down the twenty sixth, so I'm excited for that. Also, yeah. let's talk about it real quick before we get into our interview with the two distinguished gentlemen. Let's talk about the first round matchups for Lawn. Uh, for Lawn, I'm already thinking about Lawn Harris again. Let's talk about the first round matchups for the Ultimate Schmodown Singles Tournament this year. We we saw the gauntlet go through. I know y'all discussed a little bit about it last week, or a lot of it last week. Um, let's talk about our first round matchups, and I think that these are very, very difficult matchups. I got a couple questions for you, so let me throw first off to you, Drew McQueenie. Mark Andreco. If that doesn't say this is a stacked, stacked singles tournament, that is a first round match. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, this is. I mean, you say first round match for an eight player field. This could definitely be a semifinal or even a final. The way these guys play right. throughout the throughout the year in teams and in singles. Uh, looking at the numbers, because that's what I do. If you don't know, I look at the numbers and Drew McWeeny. He has a lifetime accuracy of 71%, and that's compared to Mark Andreco's 69 lifetime accuracy rate. So pretty evenly matched. They haven't had, um, especially when you look at Drew compared to his teams, I say this all the time, you know, the, the level of play hasn't quite transferred, but he's, Drew McQueen is still at the top. You can't discount him by any stretch of the man any stretch of the imagination, no matter what league he's playing in. And Mark Andreco, yeah, he played for the singles title this year, right? So... Uh, this is going to be one doozy, but if I had to pick, I would still pick Drew McQueeny. I think uh, Drew McQueeny in this first round match, I think it's a solid pick because you know what? As much as I love Andreco, I'm never forgiving him for not knowing yeah. it was it, it, the, the answer to the ready to rumble question. Of course, David Arquette was in studio this week at Collider Live, and he, and he talked a lot about the answer the actor who's the answer to that question, and it's not Sean William Scott. I'm just going to throw that out for everyone. It's actually Scott Kahn. Um, so I'll never forgive him for getting that wrong. So I'm going to go Drew McQueen. Let's go Clark Wolf. Let's go Ben Bateman. Ben Bateman we're having on the show in a minute. What another first rounder. Because Man. we know these, these, these two are going to see each other at the spectacular now uh, as far as the team match goes. We know that's occurring, but now they're going to get an early ski taste of each other uh, in round number one. I don't know, man. Ben Bateman's been playing so well. So has Clark Wolf, but Ben Bateman's been playing so well. He's got to be riding a high right now of confidence. That's why for this first round match, I got to go. I got to give it to the boss, man. I got to give it to the boss. I just think that he is so motivated. And he and imagine after Sam Levine did it, Ben Bateman following up the next year. And winning both tournaments, it's a possibility we could see it. Will it happen? I think. I think he's got a shot. Yeah, he's got a shot. He's been playing amazingly well throughout the tournament, and then you saw what he did in the gauntlet. I mean, to take down Lon Harris in back-to-back appearances—that's no small feat. Uh, that takes a lot of skill and some luck, but you, you know he certainly has the ability. And then Clark Wolf took Sam Levine into sudden death, missed. By the crudes, I mean, 
and then she wins the team tournament with or team title rather with Rachel. So she's playing phenomenal. But man, I, I, I guess I would have to give a slight edge to Bateman because he's he's been playing recently and consistently at a high level. Clark hasn't played in quite a while, I think, right? So besides the teams was which was a couple months ago, and then yeah. her her singles title match against Levine was even a little bit longer than that. So there's a big layoff there between playing and then also playing solo. So yeah, it, it dude, none of these matches are easy to pick, but I think you would have to ride ride the hot hand with Bateman at this point. So I, I, I'm going to be as diplomatic as possible here. Um, Merle versus Stacy Howard is a first round match. Yeah. Do you think? And let me just ask you this. Do you think Stacy Howard has done enough this season to get a first round spot in the tournament? You know, I think yes, and here's why. There's a lot of factors that go into this, and I think we've talked. I think we talked about it last week too with the Jason Inman scheduling thing in terms of inner geekdom and how that all played out. I think a lot of that's that plays into I'm not trying to discount CC Howard when I say this too because I know it's going to sound that way when Rachel uh, and Snyder and someone else off the top of my head I can't remember uh, weren't oh injury guy wasn't available to play in the singles tournament are all three of them worthy of playing in the tournament yes and then there's more people just them that are also worthy to be in this tournament Stacey Howard you know I think she's always consistently put up good fights in matches. You even look at her match against Merle, uh, the Founding Fathers, that live event, that match when she teamed up with Winston. I mean, she she played really, really well against two juggernauts and a team of Founding Fathers. So I think she's played well enough to earn a spot in the tournament. And, and yeah, you could interchange a lot of these people in this first round, and we'd still have heck of a players in all these positions. So, yeah, I, I know a lot of people are going to look at Stacey Howard and say, eh, I don't I don't think that's such a, a great matchup. But, yeah, you know what? People said this about Merle and, and Andrew Guy. So uh, it's kind right. of the same well, thing. Well, I didn't say that, but well, um, people said that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. But, you know, what's weird about Stacey Howard's luck is uh, it doesn't seem like she has it very much because in both tournaments – She's got Dan Merle in the very first round. Yeah. I mean, that cannot make you a happy camper. Uh, first, you're going against uh, uh, Dan Merle and John Roca, and then now in the singles, you're going against Dan Merle, who still, I mean, maybe with a few more chinks in his armor than in, in his first run, who's still a high-caliber player. I don't think anyone could doubt that he's incredible um, when it comes to the game. So I just think a little bit of bad luck. So I'm going to go Dan Merle. I think it... I'm yeah, gonna, I'm going you know to what? Too. I'm giving that one Brad Gilmore's lead pipe lock oh, right boy. there uh, for for Dan the lead man. Lead pipe? What is a what's a lead pipe? Really? What's right. a lead pipe? I mean, I understand it's what it is. Lead. Yeah, but like what a lead mean? pipe guarantee of what? What a lead pipe lock? Lock? Like it's locked? Like you know, like pipes they screw together and they lock. Yeah, okay. And they're supposed to remain that way. Well, that's totally the title of today's episode. Lead pipe lock. And guess what, Frank? Yeah. Superman can't see through lead. Let's go to the final first round match. Let's go to Chance Ellison versus big time Ethan Irwin. This is a great match because I think that Chance Ellison has shown us a lot of, of ability very early on uh, in the wrestling business. We would say that he's green, but he's got, a, he's got a lot of potential. And I think that this is a great challenge for him. This is to really see, even though Ethan Irwin is a rookie and you know going on rookie of the year, and I think maybe even the singles tournament could help clear that picture up. Because right now for me, it's Ethan Irwin, it's Mara Kanopic in there for rookie of the oh, year. Yeah. That's just how I see it. But um, him going against... Chance Ellison going against Ethan Irwin to me shows it will show chance and show show chance and show us if this kid's really got legs and can go far. Yeah, I'm really interested with this match because we've seen Chance in the tournament. He played pretty well. He actually in in his individual questions in the tournament answered 74. percent uh, That's really good in, in comparison to all the other players that we've seen come through the showdown. But you look at Ethan Irwin and what he's done. 
is average 83% correct in his singles matches. Uh, that is insanity. And Chance, you know, he, he, he took advantage of a big stage against the Founding Fathers and came out victorious. Can he do it here against Ethan Irwin? Uh, let me check. Uh, no, no, it's going to be Ethan Irwin. <laughs> it's going to be, I mean... This is I, you know honestly I, I, I honestly no disrespect to too, chance but... this is kind of the easier one to pick honestly I'm sorry uh, I think I think that Merle Howard match is a little bit easier and, and mm. no disrespect out there I just think that that's kind of a more foregone conclusion but here's the thing now let me let me look at this let me look at this bracket again because if those matches go how we think they're going to go we're going to see Ethan Irwin versus Dan Merle if Ooh, they both Lordy. win. If they both win. And on the other side, we can either potentially see Andraco and Wolf, Andraco Bateman, McQueenie Bateman, McQueenie Wolf. Um, very solid over there. But I, I think that the semifinals on the right side of the bracket is pretty much sewn up in my estimation. Oh, it's going to be Dan Merle versus Ethan Irwin. But I am picking right now. And, and this way I cannot change my pick, my prediction. It's on camera. I'm looking right in. Zoom in. Listen to what I say. The boss. Ben Bateman is going to win both tournaments this year. He's going all the way. He's winning the ultimate Schmodown singles tournament. I'm saying it right here on the record. Well, good for you. Um, I think, <laughs> I think I good for you. It's, <laughs> it's so hard for me to pick against Merle, especially losing to Andrew guy that, that does not sit well with him. Uh, you know, yes, he got a he's got a couple wins or a, a win, rather just one in the team tournament against. Uh, wait, I know this. Uh, to to not advance to the at least the final in this tournament, uh, he's it's man that's oof, Merle Irwin that that gives me nightmares really just trying to decide who would win, but I would I have to go Dan Merle. I just think he. He's he's I think he's caught up to where the Schmodown is now, because when he was when he was on with us, he said you know the game had changed a lot since you know he had last played. But I think he's since then gotten up to speed, and I think uh, he's going to be fully prepared in in every which way. Especially when you got a guy like John Roca in your corner, um, you know he wants to see nothing but the best for Dan. He's a fellow horseman, so I think with Roca in his corner, we can see Roca versus Merle. Look, that's, if that's the case. That would be just absolute madness. I mean, there's all these all these players that are going to, going up against Roca would be insanity. But you throw in Merle, that's like the cherry on top. That's the one you want to see. And I think yeah, that I think would be headlines, brother. Oof, I think we could really. I, I mean, you. How can you argue that that's not a, a, a at all a possibility? I know Ethan Irwin's dangerous, but you know he's still a rookie. I don't know how much he strategizes. Um, but I know Dan, he's he's in it, and from everything I've heard, you know, he's hungry. You hear from Roka all the time. I've, I've heard it from Christian that, you know, that we've heard from Christian that Dan is more focused than he's ever seen him before. So I think Merle can definitely take this take this uh, tournament, and uh, I can't wait to see how this whole thing unfolds. I can't wait either, but also what I can't wait for is to get the winners of the Anarchy Tournament, the team tournament, who's the boss, Ben Bateman. Mark Yodi Riley, they're going to join us on the rundown uh, right now. Welcome back to the Schmodown Rundown. Brad Gilmore here with Frank Janish in Chicago, Illinois. We're joined by our special guests of the evening. They are the winners of the Ultimate Schmodown Anarchy Team Tournament. Who's the boss? Ben Bateman, Mark Riley. How's it going, guys? How you doing? Good to be here, guys. Yeah, I'm feeling real good. I'm, I'm feeling real good. I think you guys know who the boss is. It's us. <laughs> yeah, he's, we he's know who it. the boss yeah. is. <laughs> this is correct. Yeah. This is. This is correct. Well, guys, it's been a long tournament. Uh, it's It's gone for, what, months it feels like now uh, since we first heard that y'all were teaming together. I guess my first question was this, because I saw y'all do the Riley Roundtable um, together right after the initial announcement. And it seemed like there was a lot of good chemistry there. There was there was common interest, but then y'all definitely figure out, wh you know, what areas one expert, you know, was an expert in, and what areas the other one was. Um, how f 
early on, did y'all feel like y'all were going to gel well? I mean, I think, I think, uh, you know, Riles and I, we, we've been friends for a while, but I, I think we talked about this on something earlier. Maybe it was, we did an episode of Riley Roundtable. It'll come yeah. out on Thanksgiving where we talk a little bit about the run, but uh, you, you really do learn a lot about somebody when you compete with them in Schmodown because it's, it's everything. It's, it's the sense of humor. It's interests. It's, it's what are you confident about? What makes you nervous? Uh, how do you respond to a drink? Like what music you listen to all that stuff. And mm -hmm. so Riley and I texted and talked a lot more than we had previously. And I think, you know, just same page. It's felt pretty, pretty same page from the beginning for me. Yeah. Same here on paper. I knew the, the first thing I knew was this guy knows trivia. And so I was like, I could work with that. And then when you start to compete together and the commonality is you just want to fucking win. Yeah. And we would talk about this. We were texting each other. What do we do to win? Do we, you know, do we need to brush up on some of these categories? Do we want to, you know, rely on a couple of our strengths? You know, yeah, we would go to our strengths, put them on the wheel in most cases. But there were times that we would go, we're pretty good at this strategizing. Maybe we should try this. So. I don't know. It was really easy to get on the same page. I think also like something important to point out there, just because if you're put together on a team with somebody that you see at work all the time, even if you guys uh, don't dislike each other, you could you could still be cold in terms of your strategy together if you're just kind of neutral. If you don't find someone interesting, if, if, if you don't again, if you don't share a sense of humor. And so I think that's where it worked is like minded people, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, similar sensibilities. Like I think about other people in the league that if I was randomly paired with. Maybe they'd be great at trivia. Maybe we'd have a shot. But I don't know that we would have that, like, chemistry to k stay confident, cool, calm, and collected through a whole match. Yeah. Now, when y'all saw the bracket, when it when you saw how the bracket was going to lay out, you saw what your path to victory could end up being. You saw which teams you would have to go through. Um, did, you, did you see the bracket unfolding as it did I mean obviously you couldn't see from the beginning that the Harris brothers were going to be the team uh, because JT was in the picture at the time but did you see even JT and Lon being a team that you'd see in the finals or who who did you think that you could possibly see uh, at the end of that bracket God I don't I, I won't speak for you I, I wasn't even looking on the other side of the bracket I was always looking at I know this sounds weird but you know or maybe stupid but Every single match was, oh, I'm looking at that one as the most important. I'd be lying if I didn't say that on my side of the bracket, I was looking at the Founding Fathers the whole time. I figured we were going to match up with them somehow. But as the bracket started going along, I never thought the Harris Brothers would be there. I was looking at Odd Couple. Yeah, I think I think for me, there was a... Yeah, the, probably the, the JTE Lon Harris matchup seemed like the one on the other side that I was most... Uh, afraid of because at that point, you know, Lon Harris had been a pretty, pretty menacing player. And um, Draco and Snyder are like really, really good players. But there's a there's a level of imbalance to their personalities that I thought might get in the way. Um, on our side, I mean, I I wanted to to embarrass John Roca. That's all I wanted. So I just told myself <laughs> that's what we were going to play and that's what was going to happen. So that was, that's all I thought about, really. Yeah, I, I would have hung there. What you got, Frank? Oh. Yeah, so so what did you actually? What did you guys think about that founding fathers corruption match and the way everything played out? I don't know if both of you were there or not, um, but when you did see the outcome, you know how how did you feel that uh, that outcome was handled? It's funny we just we just talked about some of this on the other show. Yeah, yeah, we did uh, we did do a follow up Riley roundtable that will drop Thanksgiving. Nice little cheap plug there, but sure. we, we did talk about it. Um, uh, I think the ruling was correct. You know, uh, let's look at it this way. I, I think it's nonsense to focus on David O. Russell with an apostrophe calling that uh, a wrong answer or wanting to challenge that. I think that's nonsense. He got it. In such a close match, I can understand the uh, the motivation on the founding father side to want to challenge it. Yeah. It's like anything. It's like, I mean, you know, I, sure. I think the example I used earlier is like the tuck rule, right? And early on, Brady was remembered, that Super Bowl was remembered for the tuck rule. Now, years later, that's not the case, but that rule was focused on a lot. And it's, I think you fight for that if you can. That's the nature of competition is that you use every advantage you have. I mean, I've talked a lot about like, this. I think I've talked about this on here before, but like you notice a lot of players never use a challenge in a match. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think in a match 
a player wants 25 seconds or 35 seconds to catch their breath. They're not given. So you challenge a question that you absolutely know is right. You let them do their thing. You close your eyes for a second and you, nobody does shit like that. And that's kind of the point is like you use any rule you have to get where you need to get. And so I get being angry about it. I think the emotional reaction is a John thing. That's what he does. He, he mm. takes it as seriously as anyone. So I understand the huffing and puffing, but they were wrong. And I think in his heart, he knew they were wrong. So I think the correct ruling was made. Yeah, I, I, the correct ruling was made. And the, those are my boys. But yeah. the fact of the matter is, Dan, the, the rules are very clear. And part of the skill of the game is writing down your answer, whether it's sudden death or your first round or the betting round. You write down your answer and you say it. Now, there's the arguments that he was first and therefore he had the correct answer. The bottom line is, and Dan would admit this, I'm sure, uh, he didn't have it in time. It came to him after pens were down. Also, and that also, happens. It's also the privilege of information. Like, you know, you can say that Dan answered first, so he should be given the benefit of the doubt. But, like, even if he hadn't written anything on the sheet, like, let's just say it was blank. He hadn't written Spike Jones, but he just had written nothing and said, oh, I didn't realize I had to write it. Mm-hmm. He's still getting an extra, like, you know, 1.8, 2.2 seconds from the sure. time they ask it to the time he has to answer for his brain to get there. And, you know, I said this to Riley earlier, but like live match, when we do John Carlos Stanton, they give us the Walter Matha question. Drew, before they even said what the right answer was, leaned over to me not two seconds after and your winner and said Walter Matha. Mm-hmm. He would have gotten there two seconds later, yeah, but not fast enough. And that's what happens. So those, yeah. those few seconds make all the difference. So you can't it, it went the way it was supposed to go. I feel for those guys when you get that close. Yeah. And with both of them, especially with Dan, Dan yeah. handled it really well. Just what he had gone through with his loss. Like, I know that he really wanted that win, but that was, that was the right thing. So, yeah. Now, um, th- there was a, oh, go, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Were you going to say something? It allowed us to use the line against Mike and Chance in that match. Do you remember this when we were picking numbers? Watching this back, this is one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Because uh, as, as a heel, you really try to go as, as you keep going until no one laughs and then you do it again <laughs> and that's the move that's like how you really do it yeah so 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 he's you know so we'll take seven you know 12 and <laughs> grammatical errors to win matches yep. they shouldn't have won and he's like oh i was like because that's what you needed to win the match and it's like yeah we got it and like that's like my favorite though, so i was glad that we could use that because <laughs> that's great it. that was my favorite as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a little bit of we saw a little bit of different Mark Riley throughout this tournament. I think that you kind of, I don't know, you 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 you've tapped into a little bit of your anti-hero. I felt not so much Superman. Felt a little Batmany to me. Is, is, would that be an accurate assessment? Yeah, uh, I think so. And I think um, I think you would have seen this this with Ben or without um, because you know I came out of retirement after having not played for about a year and a half. And then to lose like that really pissed me off. Like, it just really pissed me off. And, you know, I know I'm one of the best in this league. So to hear the chatter, it just kind of put a little bit of a different edge in me because I've also been with this league since day one. I've seen every competitor you can see come through here. And it just kind of, I evolved with it. And so... The combination of the loss, shaking the ring rust off, there was a, there's an edge to me. I want the belt. So this this is what you're getting. You know, I'm not playing with the hero that the Schmodown deserves. I'm playing with the hero <laughs> that they need right now. And that's what got us to where we are. There it is. So, you know, I think you're right, Brad. I think that there's a side to this guy that you're seeing. He's he's seeing the, the light or the dark, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's walking that line. And, and we haven't even mentioned yet your manager – uh, Finstock, Bobby Gucci, Tom Dagnino, whatever other name he has. Uh, yeah, that guy. Um, you throw him into the mix now. Wh- what does that do for your dynamic as as a trio? Uh, how did how did you guys, you know, aside from your own chemistry building, team building, and you throw in a, a guy like him? What does what does that do to the mix? A little bit like back when Rex Ryan was coaching the Jets, like you, you know, he takes he takes the he takes the criticism and the and any of the like focus off of his players, and he puts it on him. Yeah, you know, he gets to be offensive, he gets to be outrageous, um, and just the calming force of his his like. I've said this once; I'll say it again. He has like an overwhelming sense of self confidence with his decision making, <laughs> right or wrong. 
he believes yeah. what he's telling you to be right is right. And he's one of the best performers the league has. So uh, it adds a lot to us to have that that extra piece. You know, that extra piece is like a it's like a wonderful flag on our boat. Yeah, I, I, I'll say this. I don't know how it happened. The guy is calming to me <laughs> because you go into a match and you, you said it. he's very he, he believes what he's what comes out of his mouth. He believes 100 percent. And every single time we're about to compete, he's like, yeah, we're going to win this. And he's absolutely convinced of it that it kind of takes an edge off. You're like, oh, you're right. Yeah, we are going to win this thing. And that's that. Yeah, it's, he's, he's, he's a good he's a good one to have. He's a lot of fun. He is. So before we get to your actual match, um, talk to me. I know that and Ben and, and Riley y'all are both very mathematical when it comes to the game. You're a scientist when it comes to the game. Y'all watch, you study, you, you pontificate. What did you think about big brother John Harris? Were you, were you thinking that he was an X factor going into the match? Were you a little bit concerned with maybe how deep uh, his knowledge base was? Um, I mean, you guys grew up with best friends, you know, maybe some of you guys grew up with, with brothers, sisters, you know, that the stuff that you paid attention to when you were a kid, especially in those key, key ages, like, you know, when you start really paying attention, you're 10, the ages where you're really like you, you, what you, what you like becomes a part of your identity, like around 16, 17, all the way through that, like late twenties where it's, you're growing out of it a little bit. Those years are essential to what you know and what you remember. Your brother should in theory know mostly what you know, like yeah. their base knowledge is going to be essentially identical if they grew up together. And I, that to me was an enormous advantage. Yeah. And I, I, you know, we studied them because they, because, you know, JT only had one match. So we got to see a couple before we met those guys. Uh, I was, I was looking at John as, uh, yeah, but can he do this under the lights? Totally. I know Lon can. Lon, you got to you circle him and you go, he's going to be tough. But John was always somebody that maybe it's because he didn't compete a lot. I never, I didn't give him too much thought, but to Ben's point, I was like, yeah, he's going to know a lot. So you can't discount him. But at the same point, I knew that, um, I knew that if there was some chinks in the armor, I think it was more on John's end just because of his lack of competing. He's proved himself. Otherwise, I, I won't take away the fact that he can perform under the lights I just think I was looking at Lon a lot. It was Lon that I was really concerned with. And like for me, the the big the big tell, and, and you'll talk about it here when they get the spin in round two, is just that's a that's a you know lack of confidence in in your ability to play the game in the way that it needs to be won. And that's how it's not how we won because we had a pretty insane match, but yeah, it was a big yeah. turning point in the match that you know you don't make those mistakes when you play. I mean, I think I, I realized earlier I played about twenty matches, give or take. I think you must have played around the same number. Yeah, at I'm, least. I mean, you've played, I'm in the 20s. I'm sure. You've played four. Frank, with I, us. Frank will know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm nine and four singles, and then I don't even know what my team are. Four, yeah. What's your record? Singles? About nine and four. Oh yeah. So it's, yeah, at least yeah, you're about you're about almost 30, I think now. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, with teams, Wolves of Steel, and now this four four yeah. match run. So you do that enough times, you start to figure out the mistakes that you made early. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't know about you, Riley, but. I know every mistake, significant mistake I've ever made in Schmodown. Yeah, I can pr pretty much recite them all from memory. Like, oh yeah, whether it's a, whether like a bad poker a, hand. <laughs> yeah, there's just there's just like those moments where you're like, uh, I mean, I remember my first singles match I ever played was a five way, and I remember missing the what what composer was immortal beloved about, mm. and I remember saying, um, y you know, uh, Mozart, and afterwards thinking to myself. I know that Amadeus came out in 1984. I know that movie was famous. I know that Immortal Beloved came out, give or take, 93. There is no way they're going to go for an Oscar with the same composer within 10 years. Not to mention the fact that Immort like it was one of those things where like it's all there. You just make the mistake. And I've I've gotten you know maybe 10 of those in my career that I can think of that are those like why did you do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my Andrejko match is the worst example of it because I lost the match literally because of it. But mm -hmm. um, you know that's he'll remember that. You, hopefully you don't make those mistakes again after you make that kind of mistake. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Frank, did you have anything before we get to the match? No, let's get right into this match, man. This is a crazy Fra match. It, 
It definitely was. It, it played out very exciting if you were a viewer. Uh, give us the breakdown of round one, Frank. Yeah, round one, uh, Ben Bateman actually had the best score of all four competitors. You had seven points. Riley, you had three, surprisingly, but then John, yeah, John had four. I know. The first round sucks. That's your me. worst round <laughs> That's ever. Got to be my it's, worst. Well, guy, I had a bad one too. True, but th- this one was yeah, this was surprising. And my average was like seven, six, and seven. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you guys had ten points there. John and Lon, five for John, three for Lon. So they had eight points. Lon coming up with three, just as surprising as you, Riley. Uh, that one was very, very surprising. But Ben, uh, you continued to be consistent in this tournament. You had six uh, in your first three matches in the first round each time, and then you had p- come up with seven here. Uh, what is it about the first round that, you know, and, and you too, Riley, you know, you, you guys are some of the best at the first rounds. What is it, ab- what what have you figured out about the first round that, that's able, that you're able to, you know, you know, be consistently seven or even eight points uh, every time you go out there? I'm jumping first. Uh, I mean, the first round is is always kind of like the uh, the appetizer. Um, you kind of know what you to to expect. You're going to get some questions that are kind of maybe, you know, general knowledge mostly. Um, but then, like you saw in this match, sometimes there'll be some out of left field where I'm like, wait a minute, that's not a that's not a first round match. But I don't know what it is about the first round. I mean, obviously this match doesn't really show off the best of me, but um, Consistently, I've always just felt very comfortable in the first round because I know that even if you've – like, for for example, one of the first round matches I did against Sam Levine, yeah. a question was asked who was the drill sergeant in Hacksaw Ridge. I hadn't seen the movie. Yeah. But I deducted from my head. I'm like, wait a minute. That starred this, 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 and this. Vince Vaughn, I think, could play a drill sergeant. Yeah. <laughs> and totally. it's that kind of general knowledge. Even if I hadn't seen the movie – you can kind of get there because it is kind of surface level questioning. So I think that's why I've always been really good at first rounds because uh, we'll get into it later, new releases and whatnot. Doing what I do um, kind of lends itself, you know, movie talk, being a producer on that for many years, a producer of Collider Live, having to get news and collect news. That's surface level stuff. That That's usually you'll find those in the first round. So I think I can be consistent with that. I would echo most of what he said there. I think that's basically correct. It's 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 adjacent. It's adjacent information. I've said for a long time that the Shimodan works best when round one is a series of questions that are peripherally available to the casual viewer. So uh, you don't have to have seen the movie to know the answer. That's what makes round one and really makes this game compelling for a fan because you can get through the first 15 minutes, 10 minutes of a match uh, feeling like you are playing along. and, And even if you haven't seen the movies, if you like movies, you'll know. And that's, I think we both have a similar awareness of movies in that sense. Um, for me, I mean, I don't know what my all time round one is because I know my first three matches were rough and I just I mean, we haven't talked about the gauntlet, but I bombed out the round ones hung over and just badly like <laughs> I missed th- three of the <laughs> I missed three questions between those two matches that I absolutely invariably not like a mortal beloved like knew the answer and just like for whatever reason, like guessed finest hours when the answer was hell or high water, like don't know how I did it. <laughs> Um, so I don't know, but in general, like who the fuck finest hours, are you kidding? Um, I talk about too clever for your own good, but, but, um, I think in general round one is, is that peripherally available information. That's why, that's why it's, it's available to you if you have a good memory because you, you know, yeah. you remember that stuff. And I wouldn't discount nerves too. I think I had a little bit of nerves in the finals, uh, with that first rounder. Sometimes when it's a big match and you're going in hot that you can have answers like, freaking Michael Keaton and spotlight just go right out of your head because you're like, and I went in strategizing the two of us knowing what averages are. It's like, all right, we're going to hit at least seven. Yeah. I'm going to hit at least seven. You know, you're going to hit at least seven or six. That's where we need to be. Can you imagine if I hit seven? I mean, this thing would have been over. It might've been over even before that. Two rounds. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, well, but my thing is, in, in, in the first round, and, and Frank, what was the JTE usage in the first round So for, for Who's the Boss? Yeah, you guys used two two JTE rules. On, uh, it was in drama, and then the other category was Oscars, I believe. 
Now uh, I bring fancy sci-fi. I bring fancy sci-fi, yeah. I bring this up because, Ben, I know you've talked about on the show how important you think the JTE rules are and how, how much you, you uh, attribute a value to them. And you've done that before. You even talked about the challenge. You know, what is a challenge actually worth? Um, and I remember even in the, the match with uh, Corruption, you even kind of were like, oh, two JTE rules, I think, in the first round for Mike. You kind of, you know, ribbed him a little bit about it. How did you feel with, with the two usages of the JTE rule in the first round for your team? By chance, Frank, do you know the questions, what they were, or no? I, one of them was Terry Gilliam. That's right. Terry, one was Gilliam. Terry Gilliam bought me a point, guaranteed. I know exactly what happened. And what was it? Wasn't the other one Spotlight? Uh, no, this was a fantasy sci-fi. It was... Oh. oh what Terry was Gilliam might have been fantasy sci-fi. And Spotlight might have been drama. I think it was, Brazil. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, that's... Well, but you, yeah, because you, you got Keaton right. That's right. That would that would make sense. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I can tell you exactly what happened there. And um, Terry Gilliam, they asked who directed Brazil, and I have never seen Brazil, nor have I ever seen the Oliver Stone film Salvador. But for whatever reason, they asked it, and I wrote Oliver Stone, and I could just feel in my gut that it was wrong. And I was counting down, and I was like, "Why is this wrong? Why is this wrong? There's something missing here." Repeat it, realize it, get Gilliams. That's a bot point off that JT. That's worth exactly one there for me. Yeah, and it's on the last second. And the other one, um, I think that when they asked the question, you know, you know that Keaton is the guy that runs Spotlight in that movie, but you also remember there's an editor of the Globe, and it's Lee Schreiber, right, yeah. and you also know that you've got the you know silver-haired guy from Mad Men in there somewhere. And you're trying to figure out, like, who is what role, who has what position is, you know, are they going to trick Is it Ruffalo because he got the Oscar nom? That's a pretty big deal. So in my that's kind of where you go full circle and you go, you know what? Keaton's the main guy in that movie. So it's a round one question. It's probably Keaton. That's got to be the answer. And I just wanted to double check and go through each guy in my mind there to make sure that I was guessing the right ones. That didn't necessarily buy me the point, but it was the double check. And we talked about the the, the use of the JTE rule. And we both walked in from the very first match we ever did. If we want to use them, use them. We want to get those points. That's the most important. And then, uh, I mean, I think we wanted to keep at least one JTE, uh, JTE rule in the first round if need be. Two here was just, you know, it's the finals. You got you to gotta take it. Yep, 100%. I mean, I, I, don't, I would use all three JTE rules in the first round if I had to. I don't care. It's... It's, they're so worth it in the first round, especially for a team match where there's 16 points available to you. I, I think uh, I think everyone can agree that it's pretty good usage, especially in a team setting. Yeah. Now let's get to round number two, Frank. Give me the breakdown of round two. Yeah, number two. Wow, this was where things went really <laughs> south for uh, John and Lon. They spin away yes. from new releases, end up on scores and soundtracks. They get three of the six for five points. You guys steal all three of their misses. They were multiple choice, so they're only worth one point. Uh, spinning away from new releases, kind of touched on this a little bit ago, uh, Riley. Um, what are you thinking? They just pass it up, and then it scores in soundtracks. Something you're very comfortable with. Yeah, uh, I can't believe they spun away from new releases. Oof. Ben touched on it. Lon, being Lon, what he does in this in this industry uh, I, I, I could not believe it. They landed on it. And I went, here we go. Yep. All right. We're going to have ourselves a match. <clears throat> and then he spun away. And, uh, you, I believe mentioned John in this particular, uh, circumstance. I think if it's Lon by himself, he takes that category. I think I seem to remember Lon looking at John and John kind of giving him this, like, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to help you too much. Look yeah. and Lon feeling like he needed to include his brother and they needed to be a team and unified front, which I understand. I understand that whole thought process. And we're reading all this in their eyes, by the way. This has not been confirmed, but that's just kind of yeah. what I'm <laughs> reading as I'm seeing the interaction. And I, I get it. But that's also that that moment where if it's Andrew or it's Riley and we're in that same sort of situation where it's movie release dates and he looks at me like, I'm just going to say, like, this is our move. Yeah. If I get if I go 12 points here, we still get 12 points. It doesn't make any difference. And, you know, that's, I think, what Lon should have done there. Yeah. And, well, you've seen this at work with us. We've landed on opponent, uh, uh, Spinner's Choice. Do we take movie release dates, even though that's not one of my strengths? Yeah, hell yes, we do, because yeah. I know it's him. And so we can confer. There are going to be times I'm going to know it as well, but that's a strength of his. The fact that we can confer, you take that strength. 
same with scores and soundtracks. It's on me. I know scores and soundtracks. You know some, but you damn right we're going to stay with it because it's a strength. I think if it's a strength for Lon, it was a big mistake that they didn't stay. Yep. And then when y'all go up and um and and Frank, give me the breakdown for them, and then I want to jump into the category. Yeah, well, this is pretty easy because they get Tom Cruise and they go six for six, all twelve <laughs> points. This yes. this one was uh, an amazing watch because I felt like there was some deep pulls in in this one for casual. Well, fan. well, that, what what I wanted to say, yeah. yeah, what I wanted to say about Tom Cruise category is what a potpourri, a variety of of different types of questions within one category. It wasn't all who did Tom Cruise play, you know, what character did Tom Cruise play in X movie. It was Oscars. It was this. It was that. It was kind of all over the board. Um, and it was a really, in my opinion, a more difficult category than maybe most people thought Tom Cruise might be. But y'all navigate through it very well. Six for six. Give me your thought process going through that round. And how, how great did it feel to nail all of those? Ben's already smiling. I can see it from him. He's already happy to relive this moment. <laughs> I can hear it. I loved it. You know, Riley, Riley kind of looked at me he, and, uh, you know, he walked over and I looked at him and I said, you know, we win this match right here, right now. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, no, not, not really. But I, I think, I think, you know, we looked at each other and it was like, how many categories are left on this wheel that yeah. we spin? We have a less than 50% shot. And it was just like, I, this is a good enough category. I mean, Cruz is my guy, but he's also been making movies for a long time. And I've seen what happens if I, I remember correctly, Scott Mance in a match a few years ago got Tom Cruise, and two yeah. of the questions in a singles match were like, "Who played his wife in the firm?" Do you remember this? Oh yeah. Do you know yeah. that answer? Because I was like, "What?" Uh, wow. What's her name? Uh, her name is yeah. It's Jean Triplehorn. There it is. So I was Five, never gonna get there, four, right? Three. Yeah. <laughs> And there was another one in the same match where I was like, huh. I mean, I think I know Cruz pretty well, but I was like, come to think of it, I've only seen the firm once. It was a long time ago. How many of his movies are going to be like that where it's, you know, what plot point in this Cruz movie? And so, uh, but at the same time, it's there's two of us. Yeah, that that was the thing. You know, I go over there, we confirm, uh, or we at least talk about it with uh, Finstock, with you, the odds of, of landing on something that we might not be good at uh, outweighed the fact that, you know Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is notorious for action. That's the first thing I thought of. That's going to be in his wheelhouse. I've seen every Tom Cruise movie there is. I know that he's he's not necessarily a strength on paper for me, but I know enough that, um, yeah, it was an easy thing to do. Let's do it. Let's roll. And the greatest, greatest movie star of all time. What are you going to do? Exactly. But at that, let me, point, that let point. Let me ask you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and I was going to say, at that point, though, we took three points from these guys, yeah. and we were tied. <laughs> so right there, it's like, okay, we could probably navigate this pretty well. Because if, if even if, let's say, we, we go to multiple choice every single time, we're up six points. You're just playing ball control at that point. That's, yeah. That's yeah. all it is. Exactly. Now, let me ask you about this question uh, of Tom Cruise's debut. Like, come on, man. Like, where did, where did you come up with this one? That's actually not the hardest question, I don't think. The Endless Love answer. Oh, okay, true. Endless Love is, I mean, that's a hard one, but if you know, I mean, again, I, when I say that he is the greatest movie star of all time, you know I love the guy, but he's also very arguably the most famous movie star of our lifetime. Yeah. So it's the first movie that he was ever in. Tom Cruise has been in like 42 movies or something. It's not like he has that many movies. Mm -hmm. So if you know, you just know. The harder question was the Cocoa Puffs question. And a few yes, and that's actually, that's Completely, a thousand percent correct. <laughs> yeah. That's one of those like I I knew because I was listening to a podcast about a few good men a week earlier, and they made the joke. Wow. It's funny that he has Yuhu and Cocoa Puffs in his room, and I was like, oh, like it, yeah. <laughs> and that he whispered that in my ear because we that to talk about teamwork. I mean, we knew we got to the Fidelio, yeah, yeah. which was fantastic. Cold trickle, just yeah. yeah. Sorry, the pun trickled off my tongue because I know that freaking <laughs> movie yeah. backwards and forwards. But when it, when it came to that last question and we could lock this in with 12 points, he's like, it's Cocoa Puffs. And I'm like, are you, are you serious? I think, what I think that actually happened, Riley, is that I think I leaned over to him, no joke. And I oh, said, yeah, you did. I think I said, I can't believe I actually know this, but it's yeah. Cocoa Puffs. Yes. I'm sure it's Cocoa Puffs. And I went, are you sure? And you're like, 100%. I, 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 I'm like, 100%. <laughs> right now, it was gravy. By That's then, amazing. it was gravy. If we if we miss that question because it happens to be Cocoa Pebbles, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, I, whatever. Yeah, we're up by ten. I couldn't point. believe it. So yeah, it was. I mean, that round was that you could see the look on Lon's face as it was happening, where he was sort of by the fourth question, he was just sort of like, 
we're, we just, we're done. That's over. We lost. I don't, how are they doing this? Like what's, yeah, they're going to 12 owe us. The fact that we 12 owed them. It yeah. Was just, well, yeah. And it also uh, gave way to one of my favorite lines from them. I will allege that they are Tom Cruise under <laughs> there from <laughs> there Mission Impossible and they're going to pull back the mask. I thought that was great entertainment. Yeah, that's really good. Well, I guess the, the the next round would be pretty easy to get through. But Frank, give us the the rundown on it so we can talk about yeah. this final round because these fine gentlemen have to get out of here soon. Yeah, for the sanct of uh, consistency, they got John, Ben. You end up spending John Carpenter. You guys wager two points. They wagered three. You got it right. They got it wrong. Um, and that was all she wrote for this one. Yeah, yep. that was that was a surreal moment, too, <laughs> the John Carpenter thing, because because like we had said going into the match, it was one of the it was one of the wheel slices we were going to spin away from. Yeah, and I think that they requested it. I'm pretty sure it was their they, category. You know what's funny? Uh, they did not. They because uh, I was backstage with them and Bibiani was back there with us, and we saw that it was on there. Um, you know, it's a it's a kind of a strength for me. Um, so, but. Bibiani being Bibiani, he was just like, all right, well, I'll, I'll ask you some questions. And Bibiani starts throwing these like, huh? What movie is that? You know, he's like, oh, it was The Fog. I'm like, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So, I, so I, I, I think we all kind of back there just kind of milling about before our match. Um, it didn't seem like they picked it. Maybe they were trying to fool me. I don't know. But yeah. either way, they didn't get it. So. I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I know of most of Carpenter's movies. I've seen over half, probably. Um, context questions, like the name of a character, for instance, uh, that's harder for me. So the fact that Riley pulled Lopin is like, uh, I mean, that was just, you, you think about sometimes the way things are destined. That was to me like, this obviously was destined for us to make it to the spectacular. Because like, that we, you know, we needed to put up this dominant performance and that's what we did. Yeah. So you you TKO or you KO yeah. the Harris brothers straight knockout in the finals. You couldn't go off in a better way. Um, I guess you know because I know you got to get out of here. Let's talk about real quick spectacular Shire Wolves. Uh, uh, one, Riley, one question you, I have really quickly here, yeah. Ed, before we move on. Um, how many times in the history of the Schmodown has a five rounder ended in three? Do you know? This might be the first one. Uh, I'm well, fairly when confident. When did the, the Star Wars match? When did that? Well, win? that 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 beside the Star Wars one, yeah, that did enter. How about top ten versus the Patriots? That's, pro- uh, I think that ended after those. I don't. It's possible, I but I think the, it was a speed round. It's possible. Yeah, I, th- I don't remember, but very few to answer your question. <laughs> you can correct me if I'm wrong as well, but somebody somebody actually tagged me on the page that uh, the 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 points we put up beat the points of uh other finals uh teams uh i i don't know if that's correct or not we were at 27 yeah well shire wolves in their in their their five rounder against sick in the head they got 29 through four rounds they got they picked up their final three points in the speed round so 27 is probably the most in a five round three round um that's probably correct i can't imagine uh, y'all probably would have had 40 <laughs> by the end of the match that's, that's yeah. what it was looking like it was looking like 40 I'm not, I'm not even joking. It was looking like 40. <laughs> this was going to be Wilt's 100-point game. That's what this was going to be. But, you know, it was more like Kobe's 81 because it just didn't go as far. So, you know, sure. it's okay. I'll there it is. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, talk to me about the Shire Wolves. Of course, Mark, you have history with Clark Wolf. Y'all were a very successful team. Um, and, and Rachel Cushing has been a force uh, in every division. Now they've joined forces and been a very dominant team uh, if not one of the most dominant teams we've ever seen in the Schmodown. Uh, how do y'all feel about going against them in the biggest event? Spectacular. Boy, uh, I, I this is going to be the hardest match by far. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't get the talk uh, that some of these fans do with the Shire Wolves. You know, uh, they're, they're the best in the, the game right now, and the, and the belts on their shoulders show this. Uh, Rachel Cushing... Uh, you know, arguably could be a contender for player of the year because of, I mean, I, I don't care about, you know, I care about belts and winning them for sure. But this person went to the finals for an inner geekdom. She had a title shot in singles. She then wins the belts in the team. I mean, these are three leagues of high end play. And then you have Clark Wolf playing this out, you know, as well. These are two of the best players I've ever seen 
I'm taking them damn serious. Yeah, I think uh, what you can say about these these two ladies is that um, they are two of the best the game's ever seen. I think uh, it's a strong argument. You know, if if you if you say there's 12 to 15 elite players in this game, where on any day it could be, you know, like just they're like in the top half. Like they're like the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth range of best players that have ever played. Um, one more win for either of them in a high level could jump them into Mount Rushmore. That's how good these ladies are. Yeah. And the fans are the fans, and, and they can talk all the smack they want. Um, nothing can be taken away from how talented these competitors are. I mean, I've, I've lost to Rachel um, twice. <laughs> I've lost to Clark once. I've never beaten either of them. And I take them about as seriously as you could possibly imagine. I, there's nothing I want more than to beat them. But, Frank, I just do I want to hear you say something out loud here for me. And it's that uh, I don't know if you saw this morning there was – Something published about front runner right now for player of the year, and I think it wasn't Rachel's name on the list. I think it was my name on the list. No, this is true. And I actually I saw I saw that, uh, and even um, Jen pointed out you're on a six hour run between two leagues. Uh, it's an impressive, impressive run. You've played really, really dominant. I have to fully agree that um, you know what you've done over these past couple of months is definitely worthy of that. Absolutely, but you know, you see how hard it was for him to say that. I mean, he was gritting his teeth. I told Riley at the beginning of the show, I'm going to get Frank to say it out loud and threaten to quit, quit the quit the show if he doesn't say it. But I figure I wait till the end. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, look. Well, I mean, look. I'm like I'm not blind to the facts or to what's going on. So uh, yes, when recognition is due, I I give that due respect. Well, thank you. Appreciate All that. Right. He lives in his own fantasy world, but hey, I do want to say you. you thank y'all for coming on. I want y'all to take a quick second, plug your shows. Of course, Riley Roundtable, Action Movie Anatomy, which, by the way, I've been going in the back catalog, and I checked out the Fast Five review uh, that y'all did on Action Movie Anatomy. Very, very good. I can't remember the, the tagline off the top of my head, but yours was very good. I enjoyed it a lot, uh, but plug the shows real quick. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, the the upcoming uh, latest Riley Roundtable, it's going to drop on Thanksgiving. It's going to be on the one-on-one with Christian Harloff Podcast One feed, uh, as well as Collider Podcast on YouTube. We we basically break down our run uh, through the tournament and uh, some kind of behind-the-scenes stuff that we were thinking. A lot of fun. That one was great. Yeah, you mentioned Action Movie Anatomy. Um, I have a brand new show here on Collider uh, called The Action Guys that Drew and I are doing. So the second episode aired today. Um, the third and fourth will be the two weeks after Thanksgiving. And it's a super fun movie discussion show. We get to kind of take some action subjects and extrapolate them. There's some really, really fun topics coming up. Um, in fact, one of them I think you guys would enjoy is the conversation of sports movies versus action movies. Why winning is more important than surviving. And uh, that's that was the one we taped today. So okay. that's going to be yes. a fun topic. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so anyway, that show you can find. It's on Collider's Podcast Network on YouTube. And it's also available on the Movie Talk podcast feed. So check that out. Um, and then patreon.com slash team action if you guys want to get really exclusive behind the scenes, pull back the curtain on Schmodown. And, you know, we do Skype calls with fans and stuff like that. All right. Well, that has been the boss, Bateman and Mark Yodi Riley. Who's the boss? The winners of the finals tournament. We're going to see if they can take all the belts. Come Spectacular 3. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. That was Ben the Boss Bateman, Mark, Yodi, Riley. Who's the boss? They're the winners. Going against the Shire Wolves. I think they got a shot, brother. I think they got a real shot to take it. They've been playing really good. You know, Shire Wolves kind of been sitting on ice. Who knows what's going to happen, man, but the Spectacular 3. Around the corner, Frank Janish. Let's send this. Let's just. There's not much more to say here. All right? So let's. they said it all. They said it all. You know, that's my favorite thing about Howard Stern nowadays. When he's wrapping up an interview, he goes, well, you said it all. <laughs> You've said it all. <laughs> that's what he does to everybody. But they've said it all, Frank. So why don't you give your plug of roonies so we can get on out of here? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankieJ29. And I'm also running a new podcast. If you want to check it out, it's called oh, Distinct yeah, Unplugged. Go ahead, check that out. It's on, it also has an Instagram account. Um, but yeah, check out. Check it out on iTunes if you would. And give it a listen. You might you might like it. You might not. You, you might. might like it. You might not. You know Frank Janish has to do with it. So if you like Frank Janish, you might like it. Um, you know me, uh. Uh, Chris Clark. Why don't you give let the people know? I know you're suffering from an illness, uh, a cold of sorts. But let the people know where they can find you and what you got going on. Yeah, you can find me recovering from laryngitis at uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Chris Clark eight seven eight eight. Those numbers mean not a damn thing. 
Uh, so let's rock this sucker, Brad. Let's rock it to the end of time. To the end of time and to the end of your uh, voice there. Uh, we, we'll see what happens. Uh, Chris Clark, we hope you get you better for next week. We'll be back. Same time, same place. You can find me on all social media at Brad Gilmore. Make sure you check out Heated Conversations. Booker T and I welcome Raven, the wrestler Raven, uh, on the show this week. And he tells us about hypnosis. And he told he told us he hypnotized somebody and they forgot the number seven. So check that out <laughs> on Apple Podcast, Sports Radio 610, every Saturday night uh, with me and the man Booker T. Until then, this is the Schmodown Rundown, and we'll see y'all next week. <laughs>